Welcome back to Healing Home, as we look at homemaking, homesteading, homeschooling, and more through the scope of faith and the gospel. My name is Rachel, and we live on 40 acres in the heart of the Midwest, where we have chickens, pigs, a naughty puppy, P.S., any tips for getting an eight-month-old puppy to not eat chickens, a lone goose, a duck, gardens, and whatever else we decide to try. Side note, we finally, after years of searching, found a place to get raw milk and it's making me want to have a dairy cow even more than usual. Danny has suggested milking a goat to see if I can keep up with demand. Stay tuned to see if we dive into that realm. We're about a month away from starting school. I scheduled last year's school to end in the middle of March, which was just a little before baby Waylon was due, so we wouldn't have to think about school after he came. It worked great for us. And although I'd like to wait until after Labor Day, which is common around here to start school, I'm really feeling the push to start school. So one of the things we're doing today on the video is tidying up our homeschool area and organizing a curriculum. I'll just remind everyone now that I'm not a full-time stay-at-home mom. A lot of people assume that I am, and every once in a while someone comments about it to the effect of, must be nice to have the privilege of being a stay-at-home mom. I'm not. I recently read that somewhere around 68% of moms with kids 0 to 7 are still in the workforce in the United States. And so I'm going to assume that there's a large portion of my audience that is in fact working moms. So I'm certainly coming from in the trenches with you. This week, we're going to chat about cleaning and organizing routines. We'll chat about my declutter routine, laundry routine, homeschool declutter, and a splash of other cleaning tasks. But I don't have just footage from cleaning. You'll see us finishing up uh, harvesting our cherry tree. Um and doing other homesteading tasks. For those that like the faith application, wait until the end because I'm going to read a section from my Cultivating a Healing Home devotional. The section that I'm going to read is from the devotional title, The Sanctification of a Messy House. I'll link the book in the description and in the card above, but I'll warn you that it was one of the first times I self-published anything and there are some minor typos and grammar errors in the book. And finally, I have a resource on my Healing Home blog a daily routine cleaning checklist printable, which is totally free if you're interested. Welcome to Healing Home. I hope you're encouraged and inspired by your time here. This past weekend, we did our big home clean out. I usually do these twice a year, once in the winter, sometime after the holidays settle down, and once in the middle of summer before the school starts. Our biannual declutter basically entails me going through every room of the house and taking um, and, and donating anything that does not fit into our lives anymore. I usually take larger toys out a month or two ahead of the time and put them in our furnace room to see if the kids miss them. Most of the time they don't, but every once in a while a kid looks for a toy that I didn't think that they would miss. Then all of those toys in the furnace room just naturally head into the car to be taken to the donation center. Lisa from Farmhouse on Boone, and I think the podcast Now That We're a Family talks a lot about how kids actually play better without toys. Their brains are more creative and they spend less time bored with toys. Don't get me wrong, we have plenty of toys. I store them in every single room of the house and have storage baskets and containers so they're all contained and organized in a uh, um, more aesthetic way. But I also don't feel guilty about decluttering the abundance of toys that we, we just don't use. Of course, we do more decluttering throughout the year than just these two big ones. I'm constantly evaluating areas that don't work with our family. In our master bath, I built a corner shelf thing that's, office, that's honestly driving me nuts because I don't like the efficiency of it anymore. But I don't have the time to do a big DIY project right now. I think we sometimes get stuck in the final result mindset in our homemaking and don't take care of an area with the excuse that we don't have the time or money to do it properly. In the case of these corner shelves, I realized that if I just made the shelves more efficient with new storage containers and got rid of the pile of towels on top of each basket, that I would feel a lot better about the area and it would actually serve my family better. Don't underestimate the power of small changes in your home. I wish I could honestly go on about somebody who is naturally untidy, but I can't. 
It would honestly make talking about keeping a house clean a little bit easier. However, I'm kind of a person that's very conscientious about my home being picked up and tidy at pretty much all points of the day. I'm someone who can never leave a project out until the next day, and I literally cannot leave my house unless all the toys are picked up and placed in the correct spot, the dishes are put away, the counters are wiped down. There's been so many times where I have to get my kids in the car because they're unruly and then come back in quickly and do a quick five minute cleanup just because that's how my brain works. I've been like that since I was a little girl. I'm like talking very little. Some of my first memories are frustrations over untidy areas. It's just the way my brain ticks and truthfully, it's brought me a lot of anxiety over the years. There have been times when I thought there was something seriously wrong with me. It took years for me to finally embrace who God made me and just roll with the punches. Which leads me to talking about being secure in who you are. Our homes shouldn't all look the same. God has created us differently and our homes are going to reflect that. And there is joy in seeing other people's homes look and function differently. Don't compare yourself to other people because it's not who God created you to be. When I was pregnant with my first child, I remember listening to a podcast where the host was chatting with another mom about keeping their home clean with kids. They both declared that they were a clean person when they didn't have kids, but with each kid they added to their home, it became less tidy and organized. What was more shocking to me is that they claimed that with each kid they cared less and less about how their home looked. The story left me with a feeling of dread in my stomach. I couldn't imagine a world in which I didn't care about the tidiness and cleanliness of my home. I'm four kids into this whole motherhood thing and I can confidently say that I still care about the state of my home a hundred percent the same, if not more, as I did with pre-kids. So where does this leave us? Wherever you land on the clean scale, it's okay. In fact, it's better than okay. I want you to embrace who you are because you know what? I might be a clean person, but I do not care at all about the dust on my fans or the little dirt on my footboards of my house. I don't care about them. And I still think I'm a pretty tidy and clean person. Maybe you're a clean person, maybe you're not. Maybe you were more clean before you have kids and the task of motherhood leaves you with little care for the state of your home. Maybe you really care about the dust on the fans, but not the toys on the floor, which would be the opposite for me. I want you to know that at the end of the day, motherhood is messy, chaotic, and beautiful, no matter where where the journey has left you, and it's okay. Embrace who you are and let go of the mom guilt. Don't compare yourself to other moms and their homes. Take action to get where you want to be and let go of the the rest. Your home is your sanctuary. If you can stand a little bit of clutter and discord and it makes your person more at peace, then by all means embrace it. If the extra mess, mess and clutter causes your brain anxiety and discord, then take some time to implement routines, like the checklist I mentioned at the beginning of this video, and work on one item at a time to bring peace back into your home. If you've watched any of my recent videos, you've probably noticed me hanging a lot of laundry out on our line, which is a little pocket of peace for me. Obviously, throwing it all in a dryer would be more efficient, but in my busy life, I've learned to take advantage of the pockets of peace that I can find. Lighting a candle in the morning, reading my Bible, hanging laundry out on the line, picking wildflowers, those are all things that bring a pocket of peace to my day. I've tried to figure out a more efficient laundry routine for years, but I'm honestly not sure that one exists for my family. Our routine is now that everyone has a laundry basket when we're a -a dump-a-go type of family. Except for towels and bed sheets. I don't sort out anything else. The older boys' laundries get done together, and the younger boys' laundries get done together. And then Danny and I do our laundry separately from them. The biggest frustration with my laundry routine has honestly been socks and undergarments for the boys. 
I've tried lots of different routines like laundry sacks, separate baskets, and tons of other things. There always seems to be missing socks. And by the way, what is it with kids and socks appearing in random places? I find them in the most ridiculous spots. I finally ordered bulk black socks in two sizes. I had no idea this existed, but you literally can get packs of like 150 and like different increments of black or white bulk socks. Um, and so I got one size for my toddler and one size for my older two. I know this might sound crazy, but I threw out all the rest of their socks and that's what works for us. All the boys' clean socks go in one basket and then they take from there. That has been like the best decision I've honestly made for our laundry routine. Oh, don't po don't poke him in the eye. Just talk. Say hi. Hi, baby. Hi. Go say hi, baby. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. I also spent a uh, part of this week organizing all my homeschool stuff for the 2024-2025 school year. I'm a thrower, not a keeper, so it's a bit hard for me right now to know that because I have more boys coming up that I probably shouldn't throw away much right now. I recently asked if anyone would like to see uh, our homeschool pics for our school year on Instagram, and I heard enough people say yes that I've put together a blog post that outlines our curriculum choices and a few other odds and end resources. I'll link it here and it will be in the description. Wyatt and West are my two that are officially being homeschooled right now. Wyatt is going into first grade and is six years old. He'll be seven in Mar March and West is four years old. He'll be five in October and he's doing more another year of pre-K stuff. I honestly do believe that you don't need to homeschool for preschool. Give them good books, sing the ABC song and let them play is my formula to pre-K. However, I speak out of both sides of my mouth on this because I also say by the pre-K curriculum if you want, put them in co-op if you want, let them learn alongside the siblings, etc. if that's what you want. West would blow a gasket if he was not doing school alongside his brother. So he is doing curriculum and I do honestly consider him officially homeschooled at this time. We're doing My Father's World curriculum again this year, which we loved last year, specifically because the curriculum integrates faith throughout. Wyatt will be doing first grade, which is called Learning God's Story, and then Wes will be doing Voyage of Discovery, but I'm going, I'm not doing the full curriculum with him. I'm just taking out little bits of pieces um, for him to do. We teach the highest level possible around here, so Weston Wilder will come alongside us in the first grade curriculum as much as possible. But West will also be doing the My Father's World Voyage of Discovery, mostly for the I Am Learning book, which really is just simple letter and learning projects. Both Wyatt and West will be doing the All About Reading pre-reading program. Wyatt is so close to being in level one with this, but the assessment on their website pretty firmly placed him in the pre-reading program. I suspect he'll whiz through it and graduate to level one sometime in the school year. Because we're doing all about reading, I'll be modifying the lit literature and reading section in my father's world curriculum. I digress though. If you want to hear more about our homeschool curriculum choices, you can go over to the website where I outline everything in more detail, or let me know if you'd like a separate video about our homeschooling decisions. Back to cleaning. My cleaning routine tends to be instinct. 
There are things I do every single day, like putting the kitchen to rest, which just means at the end of the day, the dishes are put away, the dishwasher is being ran for if it's full, and clean tea towels are put out. The Homemaker Chic podcast inspired me with that routine, and I try to implement it every night, if at all possible. Another trick that I have learned is that when my floors are clean, my entire house feels clean. I realize that on work days when I'm out of the house, I I don't honestly have time to vacuum all my floors. And when I would be looking around in the evening, I got irritated easily because of the dirty floors. At some point, I realized that it was simply because my floors were dirty, so I saved for a robot vacuum, which has saved my sanity on many occasions. Robot vacuums don't get everything clean though, so about three times a week, I take a real vacuum and do a thorough cleaning. Other than that, I semi-break out our cleaning routine into daily tasks. Like Thursday, I focus on cleaning the bathrooms, and Mondays, I'm more focused on doing a thorough cleaning of the kitchen and other living areas. I have a detailed checklist printable in the blog post that I mentioned. Of course, I'm not the only one living in our home, so everyone pitches in with learning with learning how to clean and declutter. Like the boys who have their own chore list, which includes washing their bathroom floor pretty much every day. The recipe of a week. The recipe of the week is my pea parmesan and ground turkey skillet. It's a recipe that is fresh enough to enjoy during the, the warm months of summer, but cozy enough to have on a cold winter night. It does have mushrooms in it, but a trick if your little ones do, don't like mushrooms is to put the fresh mushrooms in a blender before you brown your ground turkey. Blend the fresh mu- mushrooms to the size of ground meat and most kids can't taste the addition of the mushrooms. For the recipe, you'll need two pounds of ground turkey, a half cup of Parmesan, the green kind that you get from most grocery stores in the United States is fine, uh, a 12 ounce bag of frozen peas, 12 ounce of fresh mushrooms, a teaspoon of dried basil, a teaspoon of dried parsley, and two tablespoons of nutritional yeast. As with so many of my recipes, this is a dump and go recipe where you just need to get all the ingredients ready and then dump it in a skillet. You can find the entire recipe and instructions at healinghomerecipes.co. As promised, I'm ending this video with a small excerpt from the Cultivating a Healing Home devotional, which again does have some minor grammar and spelling errors because it was one of the first books I self-published. Alright, here we go. The house was a mess and I was at my wit's end. The messier the house got, the more spills, and the crazier the children acted, the more the pit of my stomach was turning into a knot. Sadly, this was not an isolated incident. It happens quite regularly. Mama, you are strong. Most days we can take whatever is thrown at us head on. However, there are days where our resolve is weakened and our peace can get crushed by something as simple as a messy house. One of the things that Jesus has used to lead me to a more sanctified life is my messy house. I like my home neat, clean, clean, and organized. There is not one of those things that are more important than the next. I want all of them at all times. And that has become an idol of unrest in my heart. Kids are messy, and the mess is beautiful. Often, messes mean that means that kids are learning. So how does this, the beauty of a learning child meet with my idol of organization and cleanliness? Truthfully, it does not. As believers in Jesus Christ, we no longer live in the ways of this world. As funny as it sounds, that includes living in a messy house. Christ is the one who lives in us. We have the choice to let our messy house drive us toward Christ, or let our sinful heart drive us further away from Christ. Does that mean that our anxious thoughts or feelings will just vanish? Does it mean that my frustrations when I have a messy house will vanish? No, we live in a sinful world where burdens are daily a part of our sanctification. But stick with me for a moment. Our sanctification is beautiful. We daily struggle, fight, and skirmish, not for the glory in this world, but the paradise that is waiting us in the beautiful arms of our Savior. Waiting is hard, but in the waiting there is beautiful hope for our lives. 
What we do in the waiting is key. Mama, let your heart feel the anxiety and frustration, but instead of letting those feelings turn sinful, let God's sanctification draw you more near to your Savior Jesus.